right. Um, please welcome Casey Schaufler to speak about Patch V22 landing a large series. Thank you. Ooh. I keep expecting a hockey team to come down the tunnel here, uh, but I don't think that's going to happen here. So, oh, good, good, we're projecting, great. So, why am I talking about landing a large series? Um, I've been working for the past few years on trying to convert the Linux security module infrastructure from a single-use system to a multi uh, to a multi-use system where you can have as many different security modules as you want. And this is actually turning out to be a very large project because it involves a, a lot of things. Uh, so, yeah, the primary thing is what makes a series a large series? Um, if it's got more than 15 patches in it, it's by definition a large series. If it has more than 300 kilobytes of source code, it's by definition a large series. But those are just kind of the, the, uh, the uh, objective measures. The subjective measure, measures are, are a bit more complicated. If you're using multiple subsystems, for example, if you're making a change that impacts networking and the audit system and uh, the existing security modules and uh, the VFS, you've got a, a large series here. You're going to have a lot of things that you have to do in order to make something work. A couple of examples here, um, the, the LSM stacking that I'm working on. Uh, if any of you have been following the work that David Howells has been doing with the mount subsystem, uh, he took a, a, a bunch of code that was fractured and distributed throughout the system and made an even larger set of, system, set of calls that are distributed through even more parts of the system. But it works better. Okay. Uh, but this is, again, taking years to actually get, get done. Um, another example um, is the reference counting that's been done uh, as part of the Linux kernel hardening project. So instead of using an atomic T, you actually use a ref count T. Uh, this has actually hundreds of instances that have to be changed in order to make this work. And each of these is done a little bit differently because of uh, the impacts and the way that it actually affects the system that's going on around it. So why is it hard to do a large series? Um, pro usually it comes down to the fact that you're going to get a lot of bad reviews. A lot of people are not going to like the thing that you're doing. You're going to have to get a lot of people to acknowledge the fact that you want to change the code that they are ultimately responsible for. Combine that with the fact that the longer it takes, the more times you have to revise the patch set because of the things that change around you. Uh, I typically spend about 20% of my time rebasing the patch sets that, I, that I'm working on just because um, all these other people, people like you and people like you, are making changes in the code that I'm trying to, to bring up to speed. So when you're spending a lot of time just just on the mechanics of keeping your code up to, keeping your patch set up to date relative to the code that you're actually trying to uh, make different, you get that level of frustration that you don't want to have to deal with, but you do anyway. So, so what to do? I was like, if you're doing a large patch, by the way, is there anybody here who's actually considered working on a large patch set? Patch set? Okay, we got, a, we got some people here. Yeah. Um, how are you going to do about it? How are you going to deal with all the, these issues here? What are you going to have to actually do to make things happen? Well, the very first thing you need to have is somebody big behind you. Somebody who really, really, really wants what you're doing. Because if you don't have somebody to apply pressure, you're not going to get a big patch set in. It's hard to get changes made in a variety of subsystems that nobody wants. If nobody wants your change, it's just not going to happen. So if you can get a distro to, to back you up, that's perfect. It's like, yeah, that, that's, it's not a shoe-in in any sense of the word, but it's the best way. Uh, if you can't get a distro, you can probably get a, a system, for example, if um, you have Tizen using what you want to do, or if you have 
um, Android using what you want to do. That makes it a whole lot easier, a uh, whole lot more pressure and things, and you can actually apply that as you're going on to actually get the things you want. It's the 800-pound uh, gorilla technique. Um, the next thing is, and this is a fairly important aspect, if you can break it up in any way, it's going to go, go a whole lot easier. Um, stairs are easier to climb than cliffs. Uh, the very first time I came in with the patch set, I said, okay, great, I'm going to solve all the problems because I've got one of the, one of the maintainers, uh, you know, Palmar, wants everything done before he'll even look at anything. So it's like, all right, went and solved all the problems. Have, you know, about 30 patches here to make this work, and here they are. Well, what a, and then, you know, it's like, okay, what's the impact on this? What's the impact on this? I don't like this. It became clear early on, there was no way you could get that much change reviewed at once. So, we broke the patch set up into incremental stages. First of which was like, well, if we can just get Yama and SE Linux to work together without having special case code in SE Linux, would that be okay? Well, grumble, 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 yeah, we'd probably accept that. Okay, so we got that, you know, took that step, boom. Well, then what's the next step? Well, the next step is getting App Armor and SE Linux working together. Ho, 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 well, that's gonna require a whole lot more change. Well, does anybody want that? Well, actually, it turns out that yes, somebody does want that. Uh, it turns out that in our modern container world, there are people who want to run Ubuntu on their, on their hardware and Android in their virtual machine or in their containers. I don't understand that myself, but that's all right. I'm a security guy. What do I know? Um, but by increment, taking it to that level of increment, then it's, it's something that, that you can look at. So here is a step. Uh, people want to have this. We can accept, you know, people will accept that that has value. We can approach that. Um, in order to do that, your documentation is key. When you're putting in your, you know, your um, change requests, um, your pull requests, um, your RFCs, however you're going to do it, you need to describe three things. The first thing you have to describe, and this is going to go in, in your, uh, your zero, 00 of NN, uh, is what you're trying to accomplish. When you take this patch series, you're going to be able to run App Armor and SE Linux at the same time. It's going to explain the impact that that has on networking, the impact it has on the audit system, how you've solved particular problems, new things you've introduced, old things you've taken out and uh, replaced with, with new spiffier things, uh, possible performance impact, positive or negative, and any of the other things that somebody is going to put up their hand and say, excuse me, but why didn't you tell me about this? Because you don't want anybody to be surprised. You also want a change summary. It's like, here are all the things I'm changing. And you know, I'm, I'm changing the way we're gathering um, information about, in order to um, do SO PureSec, which is the way we communicate security information um, on Unix domain sockets. Well, why are we doing it that way? Well, here's, here's now. Um, and with each revision that you make, you're gonna wanna include that as well. And then in each individual patch, you're gonna have to have the context of why it is I am making this specific change in the context of the grand and glorious um, plan that we have to make all this work. I have a picture of the Rosetta Stone here because without that, you're not gonna be able to translate this little bit of code you're looking at into the bigger picture. It's like, well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this code, except that if I put it in the context that you're talking about, then I can see this other issue. Mm -hmm. 
probably the most important thing that you've, you've got to deal with when you're dealing with a large patch set, aside from the patch set itself, of course. I mean, I, I'm hoping that the code works, but um, if the, even if it doesn't, okay. um, you've got to respect and engage your reviewers. Now, this is true in any, at any level. I mean, if you're doing a small patch, you still have to get the people who are going to review it um, to understand it. But if you're, if you're making changes in six subsystems in you know, 300 files, uh, you've got to be able to get it to your reviewers in a state that they can actually handle it. Um, Dave Miller does not want to go look at audit code, period. Um, Stephen Smalley, who's looking at the SE Linux code, doesn't want to be, be looking at code um, off in the networking stack if he doesn't have to. He will if he, will if he feels like, but he, does, he shouldn't have to. Uh, at the same time, even though you can break it down into individual things, you still have to relate it all together. So you have to get the attention of the reviewers, um, separate it by subsystem so that the people who know about this bit can actually deal with that bit without looking at here, but also have enough context so that if they say, well, but then why are you doing it? Because just in my bit, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. You have to relate it back to where, where, it go, where it's coming from, what it's relating to. Then the other thing is you have to listen to what they say. Uh, I've seen many people, you know, they submit patches, they get feedback, they make minor changes that don't actually address the issues, they put out another version of the patch. And then the question is, well, why didn't you do what I said? Um, in some cases, you actually have to respond, believe it or not, and say, I am doing this because of this aspect of the, of the system, or I am doing this because if I do it another way, the, the other way, the way you're suggesting, it's going to have tremendous performance impact, or I understand that it has this performance impact, um, and that's mitigated by the fact that there is no way to do it other than this way, and it doesn't have the performance impact if you don't, aren't using the new feature. The response to the uh, the review is actually um, very important. You, more, the better interaction you have with the reviewers, the better engagement you have with the reviewers, the quicker the process goes. And you got to stick to the point. If you're always run, if um, you're making a bunch of changes to stuff that you don't have to make, if you said, "Hey, I don't like the indentation in the comments in the networking code," and you go fix all of those. Uh, you don't get very far. People don't like that. It doesn't actually add value. So, yeah, unnecessary changes to the code, um, cleanups that aren't necessary, bug fixes that aren't related to what you're actually doing shouldn't be in your big set. You can do those separately. You do those you know, offline. You do them in a, in a separate uh, line of development because they just distract people. And what's worst is they may see those things that you're doing that are not related to what your actual goal is and say, well, this person obviously doesn't know what they're doing because they did these things that, that they shouldn't have done, so I'm not going to listen to them anymore. That's not what you want to have, have happen. In a lot of cases, what it really comes down to is lobbying. If you have a big patch set, you have a lot of people, you've got to convince that your code is actually what they want to see in the, in the system. Now, of course, this is assuming that what you've done actually makes sense. Um, I won't always claim that that's been the case in what I've done, but uh, I hope that it usually is. So, the lobbying you have to do um, is really going to, it's going to center around a bunch of things, one of which is, Whose act do you need? Who really is the person that you need to convince that this code, code should go in? And if you've got a large series, this might be dozens of people. It might be dozens of people. It might be the maintainers of all the various components you're doing. It might be the people whose distro you expect to use it, who will then come in behind you and stand behind you and, and cheer, cheer you on and tell, tell everybody how wonderful you are. Uh, or it might actually be, you know, 
Dave Miller, Greg, Greg uh, KH, or even Linus. These are the people you may need to convince. The fewer people you have to convince on any one little bit of code, the easier it's going to be. If you have to try to convince Linus to convince everybody else to accept your change, you've got a tough road to hoe. If, on the other hand, you convince all the maintainers of the code you're changing that what you've got is good stuff, it's really easy to build a pyramid of acceptance so that Linus doesn't even care about it. He just says, yeah, I'll take that. You also have to know your adversaries. Now, I, I know we don't like to, to talk about this. I know we don't like to be contentious. We're a community. We're all working together like horses in a troika. Uh, in order to, to advance our, our grand schemes. But people have agendas, just like I have agendas. I have lots of them. Mwah. And I'm not gonna, going to actually uh, achieve world domination anytime soon. Uh, but sometimes there are people who maybe shouldn't be your adversaries that you actually have to deal with. For example, sometimes the author of the code that you're changing doesn't want it changed. They like it the way it is. Or they're working on another project off, on, off in another mail thread that you are, you're not even aware of, where they're planning to, to rewrite the entire thing from scratch. So they see your change and they're going, nah, put that off for a year or two while I work on mine. It's like, well, that's going to be a problem. We're going to have to work through that somehow. There may also be competing technologies. Uh, we actually saw this in the security module community recently where we had two different people come in and say, I have a new security module that uses BPF um, to make things all better. Two different mindsets on how to go about doing that. Um, they met together. The good news is you know, they're, they're congenial people um, and they've been banging their heads together ever since in a loving, caring way, of course. Uh, Hopefully, you know, we're going to get one, get a hybrid, which is the best, better, you know, it's the best of the two technologies uh, working together. But you know, we'll see. You know, sometimes that can be a situation that requires some finesse. And of course, performance. Regardless of what you're going to do, um, and somebody is going to come in and say, yeah, but what about the performance? And the bigger it is, the more people, of course, you're going to get to come in and say this. And the bigger it is, the harder it's going to be to answer the question. Because you're going to have multiple configurations, you're going to have multiple aspects of performance that you're going to be dealing with. So it's going to be hard to come in and say, here, here are my performance numbers in all the 7,000 configurations that it's going to affect. And the other thing is you have to learn. Okay, one of the things you have to learn is that some people are smarter than you are. Uh, I have learned this, I have been humbled many, many times where um, Alviro has come in and, and made pithy comments about my code, my coding style, my coding, uh, my coding approaches, uh, the design approaches, and my understanding of how, how some of the things in the system work. And that's great because that means I'm not going to make, I may have initially proposed something stupid, but by the time it gets in, it's not going to be stupid and everybody's going to benefit. Um, and some people have seen things that I haven't seen or that you haven't seen. Okay, people are going to say, yes, you could do this, but what about the locking? That's my personal, one of my personal albatrosses is locking. It's like, hey, you can do that, but you're not going to get your lock, but the locking is not right. Oh, okay, well, great, that I will learn from, you know, from the masters here about the lock-in, how that's going to work. And another thing you're going to learn is patience. Um, you submit a, submit a round of patches, you get some feedback on it, you submit the next batch, you get another round of feedback. Pretty soon, it's been three years. Um, people are still encouraging you to get the patches in, but you're, it's taking a long time. Your boss is saying, hey, you know, When's that project going to get done? Because we've got these other three for you, you know, kind of sitting back here waiting for you. And it's like, yeah, well, we should be here probably in 5, 12, maybe, 
And they start saying, <clears throat> and when's that going to be? Well, I don't know, 2022. And they kind of look at you funny. But patience is, is, patience is a virtue, or so I'm told. Um, and then sometimes, even with all this, you, you, you're learning, you're, you're making changes, you're, you're uh, approaching the right people, still some, sometimes things will get stalled. Uh, the first thing that can happen is a deadlock loop. This is my personal favorite. Reviewer one says, you've done things wrong, you should be doing this algorithm. So you fix your code, so it does that. Another reviewer says, oh, you're doing this wrong, you should be using this algorithm, so you go change it to do that. First reviewer comes back and says, no, 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 you were right, the, I was right the first time, you should do it this way. So you fix it there. And then about three or four iterations later, you realize that you're just bouncing back and forth like a badminton shuttlecock. You're, you did it this way, they complained, you fixed it, they complained, you fixed it. So at that point, you have to break the deadlock somehow. Generally, that requires either a third implementation, which is neither this one nor this one, or convincing one of the two people that maybe the other person has a point. That can take several iterations, though. And the, other, <laughs> the worst one, though, is the cricket. Um, you put out your version 17 of your patch set, and three days later, you haven't heard a thing. A week later, you haven't heard a thing. You start to send out private messages to, to the people who've re done reviews before. It's like, hey, have you had a chance to look at this? And they don't respond. Um, this is probably the, the scariest part of Linux development. And when you've got a large patch that you're on version 17 of, um, that you've invested a couple of years on, this can be really scary. Fortunately, the, the techniques for, for getting past crickets are fairly well known. Um, they generally involve direct, you know, replying directly to people and saying, and asking somebody, would you please at least tell me that I'm, that I'm doing something stupid here so that I can get some, you know, some motion going on this. Uh, when you're stalled, you really do need to break out of it. And that's, even if it means making radical changes to what you've been doing before. And then finally, at some point, you're just gonna have to give in. You need to keep your goals in sight, but you need to realize that you may not be able to do everything that you're setting out to do, or you're going to have to do it differently from the way you've set out to do it in the past. Uh, on the, the kernel stacking, it was, yeah, I have version 22 for a reason, um, and that was the 22nd set of the, the patches that I'd done to, to get to where we are today from when I started to count. And I had to give in on a whole lot of things in order to actually make that happen. So, but we're achieving the goals and that's really what's important. The code actually, that actually went in had absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to what I started out with. Complete change and that's sometimes what it takes. And the other thing is that bike shedding begins at home. Okay. If it doesn't, if what you're trying to accomplish, if it doesn't really matter whether you do it this way or that way, and somebody is adamant that it has to be done a particular way, or the maintainer of a subsystem that you have a minor dependency on will only accept it if you do it a particular way, then just go ahead and do it that way. It's more important to achieve what you want to achieve than that you do it the exact way that you think it should be done. Uh, the kernel is full of compromises. I don't know of anybody who just puts things in and everybody goes, wow, that's gold. Uh, I've seen many, many people get a lot of feedback on, on a lot of things. And again, the bigger your, your project, the more likely you are to get um, conflicting results or conflicting feedback 
and the harder it is to, to make it. So keep it, keep it as small as you can, break it up, give in where you have to, and learn things while you're going along. And that's really about all I've got to say on the subject.